Cyanobacteria have been considered algae since they were discovered. They were called blue-green algae and are still called that because of their different pigmentation than the eukaryotic green algae. Cyanobacteria are bacteria that obtain their energy through photosynthesis. They are the oldest form of oxygen-producing photosynthetic organisms on Earth. Chloroplast evolved from endosymbiotic cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria produce the majority of the Earth's oxygen. Here's a timeline of the history of Earth. The Earth is more than 4 billion years old. The oldest rocks have been analyzed are 4.03 billion years old. There is evidence that there was life on Earth at least 3.7 billion years ago. And some organisms, presumably cyanobacteria, started producing oxygen 3.6 billion years ago. During this period of the Earth's development, the atmosphere was full of methane, carbon dioxide, and probably ammonia. The oceans were full of dissolved iron. If you'd been on Earth at this time, you would have died, but you would have seen that the oceans were brick red and the sky was a kind of orange. It took a billion years of some cyanobacterial ancestor producing oxygen to oxidize all the methane in the air and to precipitate all the iron in the oceans as iron oxide. This billion year chemistry project is where all the red rocks came from. After all the iron in the oceans was gone, the oxygen could now accumulate in the atmosphere. This resulted in the oxygen catastrophe. It was a catastrophe for those organisms that could not survive in an oxygen environment, not a catastrophe for us. As you can see, the oxygen levels on the planet kept rising and rising and rising until about 400 million years ago, and then they started to decline to where we are today, with an atmosphere that is 20% oxygen. Most of life's history on Earth could be referred to as the age of the cyanobacteria, since multicellular life has only been around for the last 500 million years. Cyanobacteria are free-living photosynthetic bacteria. They do not have a membrane-enclosed nucleus, and they have a single circular chromosome. They have a peptidoglycan cell wall and are gram-negative bacteria, meaning they have two lipid bilayers on either side of a peptidoglycan cell wall. They are one of a few types of bacteria with internal membranes. In the case of cyanobacteria, they have thylakoid membranes for photosynthesis. They are similar in biochemistry to all other oxygen-producing photosynthetic organisms, and that they contain chlorophyll A, like the plants. The other types of non-oxygen-producing bacteria contain a similar but different pigment called bacteriochlorophyll. Cyanobacteria are the only group of organisms able to fix both carbon dioxide and nitrogen from the atmosphere, but not all of them are capable of doing this. Cyanobacteria lack flagella and move by gliding. Generalized cyanobacterial anatomy is shown in this drawing. There is a sheath or polysaccharide layer outside the cell wall surrounding the cells. They have a gram-negative cell wall that has an inner lipid bilayer membrane, a thin peptidoglycan cell wall, and an outer lipid bilayer membrane. In the cytoplasm are ribosomes, which are the little factories for making proteins, and also within the cytoplasm are the thylakoid membranes where photosynthesis occurs. The DNA genome is located in what is called the nucleoid. It is not surrounded by a membrane like the nucleus in a eukaryote but it is a region where DNA is so dense that the rest of the cytoplasm is excluded. Many genera of cyanobacteria have carboxysomes. These protein structures are made of the enzyme Rubisco, the enzyme that takes carbon dioxide from the air and makes sugars. Not all cyanobacteria have all of these structures, but many do. Cyanobacteria are divided into different groups based upon what they look like or their morphology. The first group are unicellular or single cells that are reproduced by binary fission. The second group is unicellular, but the cells don't necessarily separate from each other after they divide. You can recognize them visually since they look like they're in little bags. The third type is multicellular in the sense that the cyanobacteria don't separate after division but form longer and longer and longer filaments called trichomes. Some filamentous cyanobacteria grow specialized cells to serve specialized functions. 
Nodularia harveyana grows a nitrogen-fixing cell called the heterocyst every 9 to 15 cells along the trichome. The job of the heterocyst is to take nitrogen from the air and put it into form that the cells can use. These nitrogen-fixing bacteria are hugely important to the global nitrogen cycle. The last type are multicellular filaments with branched trichomes, in this case a hapalocypin. This example shows specialized cells called aconites that are specialized dormant cells that function similar to spores. One type of specialized cells in cyanobacteria are the heterocysts. They are specialized nitrogen-fixing cells in some filamentous cyanobacteria occurring every 9 to 15 cells on the filaments. They produce a special enzyme, nitrogenase, to fix N2 from the air. However, nitrogen fixation is very sensitive to oxygen. Heterocysts do not use photosystem 2 since it produces oxygen. Photosystem 1 is still used for generating energy in the cell. Nitrogen fixation is energy intensive. Heterocysts have additional cell walls to keep out oxygen. The vegetative cells produce sugars for their heterocysts to use. The heterocysts provide nitrogen compounds to the vegetative cells. Nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria are very important in fertilizing rice paddies in much of the world. The other specialized cells found in some filamentous cyanobacteria are aconites. These specialized cells survive when the environmental conditions are unfavorable. The main triggers for aconite formation are environmental starvation and light limitation. Aconites can survive in sediment for decades until conditions are favorable to growth. Aconites are resistant to desiccation and low temperatures, but they are sensitive to heat. They are not spores. They have a unique energy storage molecule called cyanophysin and use a unique amino acid polymer for carbon and nitrogen storage. Aconites also have an extracellular envelope and a thick cell wall. Now for a quick review of carbon fixation and oxygenic photosynthesis. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid membranes in the cytoplasm. Light and water are used by the pigment protein complexes in the thylakoids to make ATP and NADPH to carry the light energy. Oxygen is a byproduct of this reaction. The energy carrying molecules of ATP and NADPH are also used to power the light independent reactions that occur in the carboxysomes in the cytoplasm. The light independent reactions, also called the Calvin Benson cycle, take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and make sugars to store the solar energy absorbed in the thylakoids. The ADP and NAD plus return to the thylakoids to be re-energized by light. Some elements are required nutrients for photosynthesis. Nitrogen for proteins and nucleic acids, phosphorus for nucleic acids and cell signaling, sulfur for proteins, and trace metals like magnesium for chlorophyll and manganese for splitting water to oxygen. This process removes 600 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every day. Domestic sewage is potentially a good source of the nutrients for cultivating cyanobacteria and other algae. Sewage is 99.9% .9 water and 0.02 to 0.04% solids. The organic material in sewage is generally 45% proteins, 45% carbohydrates, 10% fats. The inorganic material in sewage contains phosphates, nitrogen compounds, and sulfur compounds. Agricultural run, runoff waste is also a good candidate for algae cultivation. While it is high in chemical fertilizers, it is generally low in organic material. Organic material is needed as a source of energy for catabolism to make ATP by either respiration or fermentation. Inorganic material is needed for cell growth. Phosphates are used to make nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and for cell signaling. Nitrogen compounds are used to make proteins and nucleic acids. Sulfur compounds are used to make proteins. 
the optimal ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus for microbial growth is 100 to 17 to 5. The general ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus in domestic sewage is 100 to 19 to 6. Sewage is almost the ideal nutrient media for algae cultivation. The idea of using algae for wastewater treatment is not new. The city of Delhi, California has been treating wastewater in an algae-based treatment plant for decades. The wastewater is mostly agricultural runoff. The treated water is used for fruit trees in the neighboring orchards, and the algae biomass is composted as a soil amendment. Discharging untreated sewage or too much agricultural runoff into waterways can lead to eutrophication and harmful algal blooms or HABs. Freshwater HABs are usually bright green. They are the result of excess nutrients, usually phosphates. Cyanobacteria HABs produce cyanotoxins. These are some of the most powerful natural poisons. These include neurotoxins that affect the nervous system and hepatotoxins that damage the liver. Chronic low-level exposure to these toxins may lead to liver cancer. Cytotoxins kill either by necrosis or disrupting the cell membrane, or apoptosis, or programmed cell death. Another class is the endotoxins that include lipopolysaccharides, the molecules that cause toxic shock. HABs cost the U.S. millions of dollars every summer. Harmful algal blooms are a very big deal. Federal and state governments spend a lot of time and money trying to deal with the problems caused by these blooms. The United States Geological Service conducts surveys of the lakes in the upper Midwest during the summer to monitor harmful algal blooms. These blooms occur mostly due to fertilizer runoff from farms and lawns. Many of these cyanotoxins in the water supply are difficult to remove by standard water treatment. Control of the HABs is a much less expensive and more efficient method than removing the toxins from the water. In 2007, 100% of the HABs in the upper Midwest of the U.S. had one or more cyanotoxin, with 20% of them at levels of concern for human health. If cyanobacteria are going to grow in wastewater after you discharge it and cause algal blooms, why not grow cyanobacteria in the wastewater before discharge to remove the nutrients and get value-added products? These products include energy, chemical feedstocks, and soil amendments. This bloom in Lake Erie in the spring of 2011 put so much cyanotoxin in the water that the city of Toledo shut off their water treatment plant for two weeks, and the National Guard had to truck in water for the residents. Cyanobacteria have a huge potential as a fuel source. They have high membrane lipid content, contain high levels of starch, and have very high photosynthetic growth rates. Their nutritional requirements are not very complex, and some fix carbon or nitrogen. Cyanobacteria are fairly simple to cultivate, and they are amenable to genetic manipulation, which means that they can be engineered to produce specific fuels or chemicals from waste. Potential fuels to provide energy from cyanobacteria include just burning to biomass. Dried cyanobacteria have similar energy density to coal, and with current technology could be added to the fuel stream in a coal-burning power plant to reduce pollution. Other fuels include biodiesel, bioethanol, biobutanol, biogas, and hydrogen. In addition to fuel, several valuable industrial chemicals can be produced by cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria have been exploited as a food supplement for hundreds of years. Arthospira, or spirulina, is generally recognized as safe, or grass, by the US FDA and does not require testing to be put into food products. Cyanobacteria have the potential to provide multiple value-added products and environmental benefits in the future. As you can see in the figure, different species can be grown to maximize protein or carbohydrate production. 